Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for continuing to join us today, especially for folks whose time zones are not uh, super conducive to, to when we're meeting. We're really glad that everyone is here. Uh, our next session is going to really focus on thinking about what ICDA has accomplished in the past year plus since we launched our, uh, our organization last September. Uh, as we all know, uh, the last year has not been what we expected when we were all together in the DC area. Um, really excited about the next year of ICDA's efforts. Uh, of course, we, int uh, we introduced our draft white paper at that point, which subsequently we hope to describe in more detail when we went to Copenhagen last March, uh, which of course didn't happen. Um, but I've been really uh, amazed by this community's resilience and enthusiasm to continue this work, even uh, given all of the other high priorities globally um, that have been taking place this past year. And as, as many of you know, uh, all of that work really culminated in uh, the release of our white paper and recommendations, which was of course um, um, overseen by our, our excellent and really engaged organizing committee that you see here. Many of these folks have been uh, active participants in this meeting so far, as you've seen, or will, will be so later today. Uh, we have 35 members who hail from 14 countries and, um, and we've really just been so appreciative of everyone here for their time and energy, especially uh, given all of the, the circumstances of the past year that they did not anticipate, none of us anticipated when they signed on for this, uh, for this role. Um, as I mentioned, we were able to release our recommendations and white paper in July, um, which really laid out not just our vision for the next phase of common and complex disease genetics, which we've of course been hearing about and that we've had conversations about long before ICDA was launched, but also thinking really concretely about practical implementation strategies for accelerating progress uh, across this whole space from maps to mechanisms to medicine. And, and of course, many of the talks that we've heard today demonstrate how that work is already being undertaken uh, in, in our community and by folks who are connected to our community uh, who we would hope to continue engaging with going forward. Um, but really, so, so what I want to talk about is actually that, that process for just a minute of, of how we have gone about thinking about implementing some of these recommendations. And I do recommend you read this. Uh, it's available at our, our website. It's about 100 pages long, so give yourself a couple hours uh, to settle in with it. Uh, and it really lays out in, in a decent amount of detail, I think, um, and, and very thoughtfully, eight key directions for uh, the, the future of the, the next phase of common and complex disease genetics translation and discovery, thinking about how do we go from variants to functions to ultimately therapeutic uh, clinical translation. Uh, and you can see listed here how we, uh, what these eight directions are that we lay out in our white paper, as well as how we conceptualize them with scientific streams horizontally with many different projects, some of which we've, we've already heard from yesterday. Uh, as well as vertical cross-cutting themes that we think are uh, highly important and uh, impactful across the three st scientific streams and can really tie them together uh, in ways that we're, we're working to implement now in ICDA. Uh, we've incorporated the first seven of these directions into the agenda for the meeting today, uh, yesterday and today and heard just some of the work that's ongoing. And of course, this session is going to, um, to really present and highlight some of the early work and deliverables that we've been able to put together and accomplish even given all of the circumstances of the world. Uh, I will just point out because I think sometimes it's not clear how this all comes together that we have uh, 17 or so different groups that meet pretty regularly, at least monthly. Uh, that includes seven main working groups focused around the first seven of these eight directions, as well as four recommendation groups that are focused on specific recommendations of high value we have uh, a specific uh, regional cohort network that's been meeting that you'll hear about in a minute, uh, a couple of flagship disease uh, initial brainstorming committees that you'll hear about as well, and a PRS task force that's just gotten off the ground, uh, as well as an organizing committee, a pharma council, a funders council, uh, and other groups that are uh, overseeing and contributing to the vision of ICDA. Uh, all between these groups, we're at almost 140 unique members participating in our work. Uh, and as I said, they each meet uh, almost monthly, if not more than monthly. And so you can imagine the administrative lift on uh, Kate and Amy in particular, who I know you've all been in a lot of contact with about this meeting. Uh, and and uh, I'm really grateful to them and to their effort for making all of this run and making it so successful. 
Um, so with that, I think I'm going to transition over. I, I'm again, really so grateful for the, uh, the members of ICDA who have made us so successful in the past year plus, even in, uh, in spite of all the unexpected circumstances. Uh, and I'm truly thrilled and privileged to introduce our, uh, our speakers for this session and to moderate this session. Uh, so with that, I will uh, transition over to our first, uh, our first set of talks during this session, which will focus on ways ICDA is driving and accelerating progress to uh, develop newer, new and more diverse cohorts uh, among global populations. Uh, our first speaker on this, well, on this topic will be Sir Rory Collins from uh, the University of Oxford, and of course, the principal investigator of the UK Biobank, who will speak to collaborative strategies for global biobanks. Rory, please take it away. Rachel, thanks very much. Um, thank you for uh, all of your help in moving this forward. Um, we've had a few uh, working group video conferences just discussing <clears throat> what the general strategies might be uh, for global biobanks that would be helpful for the kind of work that ICDA wants to support. This is the, the current list of people who are involved in that at the moment, but we are very open to others who would like to engage. Many of them are already involved in having set up uh, large scale uh, prospective cohorts, which has been our focus um, with biological samples, at least with DNA, but uh, often with um, plasma serum, urine and other samples stored. So Zengming Chen from the Kadori Biobank in China, Mike Gaziano from the Million Veterans Project in the US, uh, Prabhat Jha has been setting up studies in India, Pablo Curi, uh, the lead um, with other colleagues in Mexico or the Mexico City cohort, uh, Andre Metasplu from the Estonian Biobank, uh, Neil Riesch, uh, the Kaiser Permanente uh, study, uh, and Nikki Mulder, who's been involved in looking at uh, opportunities for setting up prospective cohorts within uh, Africa. Uh, and this uh, provides an opportunity to particularly thank Kate uh, for uh, keeping us on track. What we've tried to do is think about how we could be uh, complementary to work that's already going on, uh, supported by the Wellcome Trust and NIH and others, uh, by the International 100,000 Cohort Consortium, IHCC, uh, which is uh, led by Terry Manolio and Jeff Ginsburg. And Jeff has also been involved in our working group to see how we can uh, add to what they're doing. What they have done is try to bring together uh, all of those investigators around the world that have set up large-scale prospective cohorts, some with biological samples, but many without. And our focus has been to focus on those with samples and to think about what's the strategy for taking what exists or what gaps exist uh, and ensuring we have the most valuable uh, cohorts uh, to, to help understand uh, the determinants of disease so that we can investigate genetic and other diversity, uh, generate genetic and other kinds of assay data, collect other types of data about the participants in the study, and consider what are the obstacles to access and data sharing for research, uh, building on the kinds of topics that Mike Parker spoke about uh, earlier on. So first of all, size, as with the 100,000 um, uh, cohort consortium, we are well aware that we need to have very large prospective cohorts because only a, a proportion of the participants will develop any particular condition. And therefore, in order to have thousands of cases, you need to have studied hundreds of thousands of people and then followed them long-term. This is illustrated uh, here by uh, data randomly selected from a million people with about a dozen years of follow-up, looking at a powerful risk factor, blood pressure on a common condition, coronary artery disease mortality, uh, and just randomly selecting uh, data from 5,000 of those million people and looking at the association between risk on a doubling scale versus blood pressure, 
uh, at different ages. So if you like the interaction of age and blood pressure on a common risk factor. And what you can see is, although there's a kind of general trend upwards, uh, it's impossible to determine the shape or the strength of the relationship uh, within these different groupings. If we go to 50,000 people, the, the associations become clearer, but at the younger ages of 40 to 49, is there a J-shaped curve at the bottom of this picture? At the older ages of 80 to 89, does it flatten off at higher uh, blood pressures? And if we go to half a million people, then we get these beautiful log linear associations showing slightly flattened association at older ages. So the relative effect is weaker than at younger ages, but in absolute terms, because it's a log scale, the absolute differences per uh, millimeter of mercury are greater at higher ages. But I think it illustrates you know, really how big these studies need to be. And in reality, how we need to have a global strategy of combining data from many large studies. The second point that we've been thinking about is around diversity. And although diversity tends to focus on issues around uh, ethnic diversity, um, we think it's important to think about all of the different uh, sources of diversity, the internal diversity of genetics and uh, ethnic diversity, but also external exposures, lifestyle, an environment, because increasingly we want to look at the interaction between many different kinds of risk factor. So we know there's genetic heterogeneity between populations, and obviously that can help to assess health-related variants. But there's also you know, big variation between different populations in terms of the uh, exposures that people um, have. So adiposity much less common in rural China than in Mexico City. Diseases are rare in one population, but they may be common in another population. So again, um, having diversity in terms of where the studies are established, uh, provides an opportunity to uh, study a, con a much wider range of conditions. So for example, a hemorrhagic stroke, much more common in China than in the UK or the US or, or Western European countries. So understanding the determinants of hemorrhagic stroke may be better done uh, in China, uh, e even when applying it to Western populations. And, and of course, going back to the point about size, complementary uh, studies yield opportunities, uh, not just for replication, but particularly for combined analysis to get more precise estimates. But I think it's also important to, to bear in mind that there is probably more diversity within the studies that already exist than we take account of. So, for example, in the Million Veterans Study uh, set up by Michael Gaziano within the Veterans Administration System, there is a lot of diversity in terms of socioeconomic and ethnicity. Uh, likewise, with the Kaiser Permanente Study, a, a lot of um, a diversity in those respects as well. So we shouldn't underestimate the amount of diversity that already exists in the studies we have. Um, and when we're thinking about uh, other studies to put in place, uh, really be very careful about why we do them in a particular location. Because it is actually heterogeneity of exposures that is important, rather than trying to be representative of the world's population. We want to have heterogeneity of all kinds of factors, uh, different kinds of diversity uh, in terms of the characteristics of the participants uh, and their underlying uh, disease rates. The third point that we've been considering is around depth. Um, and I think that when one looks at the studies in the IHCC, one sees an enormous uh, range of depth of characterization of the participants in these cohorts. We've tended to focus on those cohorts that already have biological samples, but even among them, the amount of sample, the kind of sample, and indeed all the other uh, characterization of the participants can vary enormously. It's also worth bearing in mind that if one sets up new cohorts now, it will be 15 years from now uh, before they uh, will be uh, mature enough to provide uh, information um, about the association of risk factors with, with health outcomes. 
So I think um, uh, one of the conclusions we've come to is uh, looking at um, the cohorts that exist uh, and thinking about how to uh, increase the characterization of those cohorts uh, so that they provide the most scientific value rather than necessarily uh, putting resources into setting up new cohorts unless they fill a specific gap. In terms of enhanced phenotyping, you having as many questions and measurements from all the participants at time recru recruitment is critical. Um, and linkage to uh, health record systems and to other kinds of uh, uh, records, such as population data, can help us to characterize further the, um, uh, the participants in the study and the exposures that they have. So uh, looking at opportunities to provide additional data on existing cohorts through linkage um, is valuable or through uh, additional um, assessments. Considering how in the cohorts that are established, uh, deeper phenotyping can be done. Um, and that's true both of existing, but also of new uh, cohorts. What can we learn from the, the studies that have been set up uh, in order to make them um, the, the new ones more informative because really one wants to have as much information about all of the participants in the cohort and having uh, information on one subset of the cohort and other kinds of information on another subset of the cohort means that the data you have on any particular individual is limited. So I think thinking not just about size but by depth uh, is important. and as collecting as much biological sample. And again, I think when we look at the existing cohorts, um, there's often a real limit, a limitation on the amount of biological sample and the range of biological samples. So again, when thinking of filling a gap uh, with establishing a new cohort, uh, think about uh, how to collect as much um, and as many different kinds of sample uh, as possible to allow the sorts of uh, analyses that may not actually be uh, feasible at this particular point on this scale, but may become feasible over time. And when you have those samples, then uh, doing cohort-wide assays on the samples, I think is really important because uh, this is the most efficient way of using depletable sample. Um, and cohort-wide assays, although they are expensive to do um, uh, on very large numbers, are far more cost effective, minimize depletion, improve quality control, and particularly importantly, uh, the data, unlike samples, are much more readily shareable uh, when we want researchers around the world to, to use the information in these cohorts. The final point in a cohort is follow up. Uh, it, it's no, there's little point in recruiting and uh, assessing large numbers of individuals if they can't be followed for their health outcomes. And I think that that's perhaps one of the concerns about some of the cohorts that are established, um, where there is a view that people should have the right to go into a cohort, uh, even if it's not gonna be possible to, to follow them up. If they can't be followed, then they really are of little value uh, um, to, to the, the study and actually uh, diminish its um, scientific um, usefulness. Just to give an example of the importance of very long term follow up, this is the Million Women study from the UK of 1.3 million women uh, followed for 20 years. Looking at the associations of non genetic risk factors and dementia, uh, and importantly, demonstrating how the early changes associated with cognitive decline can cause many uh, changes in behavior long before a diagnosis and distorting uh, uh, associations. So here's an example uh, showing the comparison between inactivity and activity. So it appears that uh, in the first five years or so on the graph, that inactivity is associated with a higher risk of dementia. But as one goes further and further out, uh, inactivity is no longer associated with dementia, uh, suggesting uh, reverse causality where early changes associated with cognitive decline have been either cause of the inactivity 
rather than the reverse. Uh, and when one looks at this in a different way, here you can see that inactivity versus act activity, when you exclude the first 10 years of follow-up, so essentially the first 10 years are noise, um, one sees that uh, activity is not associated with any kind of dementia, Alzheimer's or vascular, uh, whereas uh, other risk factors uh, are strongly associated with, with vascular dementia, but not uh, uh, with Alzheimer's. So it really ir illustrates uh, how long it is before these studies become valuable, and therefore the limitations of setting up new studies, unless there's a very good reason to do so, and also the importance of embedding the studies within a setting where you can follow the participants long term. Finally, the problem with cohorts is not only the linkage to health outcomes, but also characterizing the health outcomes reliably. Um, and particularly in prospective studies, characterizing very many, large, many, very large numbers of many different types of outcome. And the approaches have really not been developed as yet for doing this from electronic health records or from other sources uh, at scale. And it matters. Uh, if one doesn't have a, a reliable information about the health outcome, then um, uh, false positive diagnoses will uh, flatten the association. Um, it may well be that risk factors are only associated with some disease subtype. So, for example, here, um, uh, measures of reproductive factors are associated with uh, breast cancers with hormone receptors, but not without. And we really want to be in a position where we can go back to the outcome data or to other information that helps us to do more detailed phenotyping of those outcomes. So uh, storing uh, imaging data or samples that would allow more refined subtyping uh, when that becomes possible. And there is this kind of balance between the breadth of very large numbers of health outcomes and a scalable approach versus again, the depth uh, of characterization uh, and subdivision of those health outcomes. And finally, sustainability. And this really goes, I think, to the point that Michael Parker was describing. Particularly if we establish cohorts in those areas of the world where there is a real need to do so in order to increase diversity, then in order that those data, um, that those studies can be established, and in order that those data can be accessed by researchers around the world, we have to have a fair system whereby we put in place infrastructure, not only to maintain the study, but also to build the local research capacity to conduct these studies. So in conclusion, the approaches that, that we've been working on and uh, our thought pieces around uh, uh, this is just not that there should be more large cohorts in different places, but that we need to think about where to establish the most informative cohorts in carefully selected settings or to enhance the cohorts that exist in order to make the available data as valuable as possible. Thank you. Rory, thanks so much. That was really, um, really informative, I think, for um, an overview strategy of, of setting up and, and maintaining biobanks in a, in a really high value way. We have just time for maybe one question. We've gotten a couple of questions thinking specifically about environmental exposures. Uh, as you describe the need for deeper cohort characterization, of course, environmental exposures and measuring those phenotypes will be really crucial. Are there scalable ways to both measure and then connect those exposures to the genetics and cohorts at this time? I think part of it is around linking to record systems that give you population level exposure. Um, but obviously that's gonna be crude at an individual level. Um, I, th I think that uh, NIH have, have put a lot of resource into trying to do um, individual exposure assessment, but it's all still a bit clunky. So I think there are a, a lot of opportunities to um, uh, develop better ways of assessing people's individual exposure, whether in the home, I mean, obviously the second most important cause of lung cancer is radon, uh, 
um, after smoking uh, or in people's uh, daily lives. So I think there's a, a, a lot of uh, a lot more that could be done um, in areas like that. Great, thank you so much uh, for your talk today. Uh, we'll move on as we continue in this uh, in this session focused on diverse cohorts from this overall vision of, of the strategic development of new cohorts uh, to actually thinking about some early efforts to do just that in uh, an underrepresented uh, population. I'm very uh, delighted and, and very happy to introduce Andres Moreno Estrada and then uh, as well as Ricardo Verdugo, both uh, organizing committee members in ICDA. Andres is the director of Genomics Corps uh, at the National Laboratory of Genomics for Biodiversity in Mexico. Andres uh, Ricardo is a, an assistant professor at the University of Chile. They are co-leading ICDA supported efforts to establish a Latin American Alliance for Genomic Diversity. I'll let Andres and Ricardo tell you more about that. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. It's a great pleasure actually um, to be here today and have the opportunity to present uh, this exciting new initiative that uh, we just launched with the support and, and endorsement from ICDA. And it's really um, a tremendous year where we have to think about alternatives to really tackle uh, one of the major um, uh, recommendations that actually ICDA has um, explained um, in many of the talks during this uh, uh, plenary meeting already. So to talk about this, uh, I wanna mention that uh, I will be uh, splitting this session. So this is an effort co-leading um, by uh, my colleague Ricardo Verdugo from Chile and myself. So I will start giving you a brief introduction uh, about the topic. And I think this one doesn't really need much uh, background to convince everyone that we know that genomic platforms and technologies in the past decades have really led to a tremendous uh, success in terms of mapping the associations for uh, multiple traits uh, across the genome and different uh, diseases. And really, uh, this has been growing in the past years, as you can follow in the GWAS catalog, for example, and really more than 100,000 associations for multiple traits. And really gives us a, a very, uh, let's say, colorful picture of the progress done in terms of mapping uh, in the past decades. But when we look at the um, ethnicity and the composition of the participants really uh, making part of these genomic studies in the past uh, decades, we don't see uh, a picture that is as colorful as the one that we saw in terms of the trait and the mapping for across the genomes. Uh, and this is uh, a picture that others have already uh, pointed out, including Eric Lander and uh, Ingmar Kenny. We heard yesterday how this uh, uh, um, analysis done by uh, my former lab mate Alicia Martin pointed out that the vast majority of participants of GWAS studies have been of European descent. And this bias has been persistent over the years, even though it has been um, attenuated by the increase of other ancestors including in, in genomic studies recently, also the proportion of participants and GWAS is performing European descent populations have also increased. So this really bias has been persistent and we think uh, that there's really a tremendous need to uh, counterbalance this bias and uh, there's no other way to do it than really making uh, dedicated and targeted efforts to really represent um, non-European populations in these efforts as well. So this graph actually very uh, visually spots how the proportion of participants compares very disproportionately to the global population uh, of each, each of these ancestries, for example. And this can be uh, you know, either cuts in particular points of time or actually one can follow this bias in real time. And this has been actually moved to the social science field because even uh, social scientists have been aware about this uh, problem in genomic databases and have been uh, actually updating a database called uh, GWA Diversity Monitor that you can follow right here. And again, you can um, realize that the vast majority of participants are of just one, uh, you know, these major uh, ethnicity group, where, whereas the rest is really like a very underrepresented. So uh, being aware of this uh, problem and the necessity to, to really address it is how ICDA has included in some of uh, their recommendations, particularly the need of increasing population diversity of biobanks. And it's pointed out particularly um, uh, 
the need of uh, targeted efforts like within Africa and the Americas, but also other regions like could be um, Asia and the Pacific, for example, but also the fact of increasing the size of uh, biobanks, either existing cohorts or really targeting uh, a size that is really statistically powerful enough, just like Rory mentioned before, in terms of really leverage the, the, the diversity uh, in these cohorts. So, so with that in mind, uh, is that we we can start envisioning which uh, efforts need to be starting in these in these regions, and fortunately, actually, is with great pleasure that we have seen recently major efforts in different regions uh, historically underrepresented, like for example, is three Africa that just published their paper recently uh, a few weeks ago, or the other initiative across uh, Asia, like the uh, Genome Asia 100K initiative that has also been producing. Uh, uh, genomes and depositing diversity that has not been reported before, uh, or even more globally, like other uh, efforts, like the one that Imer already uh, introduced yesterday, which is the population architecture uh, using genomics and epidemiology, which is known as STAGE uh, consortium, that already analyzed 50,000 multi ethnic samples across different ancestries. And here you can see a summary of what's the diversity embedded in this cohort, just like Rory was pointing about the heterogeneity already included in. Uh, diverse cohorts. And here I'm just uh, showing all page participants, for example, as gray dots in this uh, a very simple PCA. But what I want to highlight here is, for example, if we focus in one particular uh, ancestry or um, an ancestry group like Hispanic or Latino individuals, you can actually see that they cover well, most of the PCA space. And you can have Latino individuals really uh, stemming their diversity from any possible corner of, of ancestry groups uh, covered here. So really uh, it's a very heterogeneous group and not uh, like a single uh, uh, ethnic category as, as uh, treated in some context of medical genomics. So this really uh, made us think, uh, you know, from the page effort and many others that we have been part of, really made us think carefully about what diversity that we are missing within, for example, Latin America. And to summarize that, I'm, I'm showing this plot that we uh, uh, produced uh, several years ago, where we focused in what is the um, diversity within the fraction of Native American ancestry in the genomes of ethnic Latin American, for example. So it is not only about really the amount of ancestry that varies between individuals, but also the type of ancestry or the, the, the variation that we can find in the Native American fraction of these genomes. And you can even see that sometimes this dispersion of ancestry or the diversity is not even is not overlapping between different countries. So it's really uh, important to include all the different diversities to really uh, 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 and embrace all this uh, array of diversity. Actually, some previous efforts have been conducted in the region. So it's not that uh, we start from, from zero. There have been really uh, important uh, efforts, like for example, in different uh, regions at different scales, like the Candela effort, really one of the pioneering efforts at the Latin American scale, or other dedicated biobanks like the Mexico Biobank or the Sigma project, or diabetic patients in Mexico or other uh, nationwide initiatives like in Chile, the Chile Genomic Project or in Argentina, Poblar, Brazil has several initiatives towards that. So altogether, we realized that the region is really having already a lot of potential. So just taking into account existing project, we have uh, more than, uh, you know, 100,000 samples already as part of these different efforts, more than 38 projects. And you can see the numbers right there, including more than 4,000 exons, 1,000 genomes already generated. But what we identify that is missing is a coordinated effort that really combines these powerful characteristics that we think are needed to really create a big regional biobank, which is uh, really embrace all this diversity in, in a single and systematized way that, that, that has, they can have the enough size, the phenotypic diversity, and the characteristic of being prospective global over time. So with that in mind is that we actually started discussions in the first ICDA uh, meeting occurring uh, last year uh, in the Washington area, where we started to think about how to put together a network of researchers uh, interested and really committed towards this goal within Latin America. And um, without really telling you a lot of details, which actually you will hear from uh, my colleague Ricardo Verdugo in a minute, long story short is that I can tell you from that meeting until today, we uh, grew the group really uh, into a large collaborative network. And we have uh, a name now, which is the Latin American Alliance for Genomic Diversity, uh, for short, Latin Genomes. And this is basically what we have accomplished in the past uh, year or so of putting together this group that represents uh, six different countries or more within Latin America, 
and you will hear uh, from Ricardo all the details of exactly what's the plan that we think that needs to occur in order to achieve a decent precedent and uh, a scale effort in terms of really creating a big biobank of Latin American genomes. So with that, uh, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Ricardo, and thank you uh, everyone for joining today. Thank you, Andres, and I'll be very glad to present to you uh, the work that we at Latin Genomes have been doing uh, to present this work uh, today at this uh, very wonderful meeting. Um, next, please. So uh, since our first meeting in September of 2019, we have been working uh, during this year, although the pandemic, uh, together with uh, a large number of, of researchers, uh, in Latin America to try to create a plan to implement uh, a solution for this lack of uh, presence of Latin uh, ancestry in the worldwide uh, catalogs of genetic diversity. And we started by contacting, contacting uh, who we thought were uh, leaders in the region in terms of, uh, of projects for population genomics. And um, after doing a survey to make an initial diagnosis, we have had three round table meetings so that we can together discuss uh, these ideas. So yes, next please. So the survey was uh, distributed in March and we asked five questions. First, what is the current status and previous work that has been done in your country in terms of population genetics? And Secondly, what are your ideas and projects on how we can move forward this field in your country? Then what are the challenges that you identify or major bottlenecks in order to scale, to scale up these projects in your country? Uh, what are the estimated costs that you think the, the, these projects at a higher scale will have? And uh, do you identify any potential funding sources in your own country or in the region? And with that information, uh, uh, we, with the help of, of, of Kate Balakonis uh, uh, and Rachel at ICDA, we summarized the results into this table and where it helped us to see that th there are different issues that have uh, uh, more or less prevalence across the region. For example, funding, access to funding in order to scale up is, is commonplace, right? Um, and that is related also to the fact that we haven't been that successful in to engaging the local governments and local community in convincing people and, and decision-making authorities uh, in the importance of, of, of capturing and studying the genetic diversity that is in our populations. But then there are some more specific problems such as infrastructure and, and training in those countries that are less advanced into, in this field. Uh, whereas other countries that have made more progress may have other barriers, for example, retaining scientists uh, in their countries. And, uh, and, and probably those that are even, uh, that have already in place some cohorts that span across the, the, whole, the whole country will find that data harmonization is a problem. Having access to, to the technology uh, and, and techniques to, to have all these different centers harmonized. Uh, or, or, or even in, uh, such as in Mexico, just capturing information from electronic medical records. So uh, next please. So in, uh, in summary, we see that there are multiple groups that have, have experience working in this field locally, uh, but without any regional coordination, neither in funding or, or aims or products to be uh, generated from all of this. And, uh, and that insufficient funding is commonplace in order to scale these, these projects. But then there are a number of barriers specific, uh, country specific barriers, and therefore the solutions will have to be tailored to each of the country's reality. Next please. So in the second phase, we have had these uh, round table meetings where we started by brainstorming about uh, not only the challenges, but the, the ideas of, on how to bridge those uh, the, the gaps that we have identified. And, and this slide is to mention that this is a large group and, and it's a diverse group regionally. 
but we also we don't have yet all the Latin America included in this map, and, and also that is a challenge for this uh, alliance that is just starting, and, and and we look forward to have more people involved from other countries in the region. Um, next, please. But together we have been able to uh, put together um, a, a common vision, and in that vision we see that we have a need for creating a network of cohorts associated with biobanks, um, both retrospectively and prospectively, uh, with the types of, of characteristics that uh, Rory Collins just presented uh, in the previous talk, of course, in order to maximize uh, a, 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 the, the gain from this project and also to make it internationally relevant. This network of cohorts should serve both the indigenous and the admixed populations throughout the Americas and should be founded and led by regional scientists, but in close collaboration, and as was mentioned before, also fair uh, and productive collaboration with the international community. Uh, it should be aimed at accelerating the application of genomic medicine in the region and in Latin American populations abroad and by actively engaging with the local communities and governments in Latin America to provide infrastructure to build up the local scientific capacity and training in genomic research so that this initiative is sustainable in the long term. Uh, next, please. We have two major goals. The first goal is uh, to create a public resource for imputation of human genomes of Native American and multi-ethnic mixed origin uh, that will serve the whole international community and that will be created both from uh, historically collected samples and data, but also from prospective uh, initiatives that can start uh, uh, with, uh, with a new setup uh, and, and rules uh, um, according to the, the, equi the global equity rules and, uh, and quality, biobanking quality at the international level. And then uh, the second goal is to build up a network of biobanks to reach 1 million of diverse genomes from the Americas that will be also linked to health records and that can be followed in time in the future in, with harmonized uh, procedures across the different centers in Latin America. So it will be a completely major challenge uh, that we think but that, that is needed, but that we as a region can, uh, can overcome and, and, and move forward. But it's not gonna be easy. And in order to achieve this, we started by splitting our group into working groups that will address each of the major themes that we have identified, such as building up local capacity or creating a common data sharing policy uh, for, uh, to, to serve the whole community, uh, creating the imputation resource and the community and government engagement also that also linked to ethical issues, uh, how to do the biobanking the right way and, and how to uh, link ourselves to international uh, communities in scale up. We, together, we plan to write up a, a white paper that would summarize both who we are and what we want to accomplish, but also what is our strategy and what, what methods we think we are most effective in order to, uh, to accomplish these goals. And this is a work in progress. We are meeting very regularly right now. It's a very active discussion and we don't have this uh, recipe or a strategy right now to be presented yet and we hope to do so in the next meetings and also in this uh, white paper but the invitation is to participate and uh, help us and also in collaboration with other working groups of, at ICDA in order to to come up with the best plan possible next please and i just finished by acknowledging the hard work and commitment by all of the people that is shown in this slide and and uh, not only the leaders in Latin America, but also Kate and Rachel that have been pivotal in order to help us uh, move forward in, in, in this effort. And uh, next, please do contact us uh, either by email at latingenomes.icda.bio or by Twitter at uh, Latin Genomes. Uh, thank you very much for your patience, for your, for your presence here.
Thank you so much, Andres and Ricardo. That was great. Um, and it's really personally been uh, just really uh, so great to be part of this effort with you guys. Uh, I think we have time for a question. Um, I'm really curious in your view, uh, what early concrete steps ICDA or and, and or the international community uh, could take to support you in these efforts as you're getting started? You want to address? Uh, well, I. I, I see many, many, uh, many ways. Um, we can definitely learn from other experiences and we should work uh, very uh, together with other people, for example, in biobanking or regulations, because we are, we are studying and actually, at least here in Chile, there is a lot of excitement about this. Um, we were just contacted by the, our local agency with a very short line, um, um, we, we, they are asking us to, to write up an actual proposal for a network of biobanks here in Chile. And, and doing that, starting with the experience from other biobanks, as, such as the UK Biobank, for example, or, or the African experience, would be great. So, so it's, these are exciting times. Yeah. May I add just very quickly uh, something on that topic? Because I think one of the major things that is lacking is uh, really uh, create enough awareness across funding bodies to really, um, you know, realize the coordinated effort that is needed to reach this scale. So we already mentioned that there are local, regional, very important previous efforts and that those have been like very important for each uh, region. But if we want to really target something uh, that is uh, even seen as, as locally at the global scale, but still uh, large enough to really cross nations and populations and, and, and stakeholders that I think we need really uh, uh, funders to step in and really uh, dedicated efforts such as H3 Africa were successful in doing uh, things like that in, in getting like enough funding to really have a big effort coordinated across the region. I, I think it's the only way to really do this um, uh, globally and in, in a collaborative way internationally. So that's why we are uh, launching this initiative. I think it's important. Great, thank you both so much uh, again for your presentation. Uh, I think we're going to move on now to the next session or to the next uh, segment of this session, uh, which we is titled New Disease Specific Scientific Programs. Uh, this will focus on uh, one of those eight directions that I mentioned previously, uh, the cross-cutting disease specific efforts that will work to translate from maps to mechanisms to medicine in specific disease areas. Uh, I am very, excited to introduce Ben Neal and Cecilia Lindgren, who have been uh, very engaged and active members of ICDA's organizing committee and before, really from the very beginning of ICDA being set up, uh, have been thought partners and, uh, and great collaborators as we've uh, all worked to define and implement what ICDA ought to do and ought to be with the global community. Uh, ben will uh, get us started. Uh, he is an associate professor at Mass General Hospital and at Harvard Medical School and an institute member at the Broad Institute. Cecilia is a professor and senior group leader at the University of Oxford. Uh, ben, please go ahead. Thanks, Rachel. And thank you for organizing such a fantastic meeting. Um, it's really been chock full of exciting science and exciting plans for the future. And I think it really underscores the unique moment we are in our species history, where you know we, we've kind of had this genomic variation for a really long time. We now have ways of measuring it and, and starting to associate it and link it to disease. And so the question before us is really, how do we kind of build that roadmap to drive these diseases to nucleotide resolution, understanding what genes and variants really matter at a base level, what those bases do, and how that relates to how we think about the kind of prevention, diagnosis, management, and treatment of disease uh, for all common diseases. And I think that that is absolutely within our field of view as a community, and, and I can't think of a more exciting time to be a, a, a geneticist. So as you know, Rachel introduced at the beginning of the session, we're really targeted here on the, the flagship disease projects. And these were conceived as sort of cross-cutting efforts that really draw from each of the horizontal thematic uh, areas of mapping, understanding mechanism, and then using that to develop the next generation of medicine. And for each of those different focus areas of scientific activity, we really need to figure out a way to, to kind of make that uh, a kind of straightforward and streamlined process for any 
human disease. Really, any common disease is, is the sort of playbook that we're trying to, to develop here. Now, I'll walk through uh, a little bit about what our charter is and talk a little bit about some of the reflections on mapping, dovetailing very nicely with the talks from both Rory and uh, Andres and Ricardo. Uh, and then hand it over to Cecilia, who will walk us through some of the kind of mechanisms, ideas, and how that relates to moving forward to medicine, how we're organizing ourselves, and, and really what we want to hear from you, because this is going to be a, a community effort. This isn't going to be an individual effort. And, and Michael Parker's talk on like the ethics of a shared community problem and how we think about those kinds of things uh, is exactly the spirit that we carry to this work, because these are fiendishly complicated problems that we're trying to solve. Okay, so here's the proposed charter. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm just going to let, you know, kind of pause for everyone to read it and then highlight a few things. Okay, and, and the thing to really highlight here is that we're looking for at least 10 flagship disease projects. And the idea behind looking for at least 10 disease projects, flagship disease projects, are to ensure that we have lots of different kinds of diseases represented. We foster opportunities for working across diseases of, of learning and borrowing ideas about how uh, we might, you know, find map individual genetic associations, identify genes, link genes into pathways, all of the different biological examinations that we've heard described in the, the various talks over this meeting, how do we start to kind of work together and how do we develop those community standards and how do we facilitate this work being done by a broader community more, more generally? That, that's really the, the spirit of the flagship disease projects is to think about these community activities and how, how we might facilitate those things. So what makes a flagship disease? Well, this is a, a sort of slightly more built out view of this M to M to M challenge of you know, going from samples to the individual variants and then from variants to genes and genes to cells and genes and cells to processes. And then those processes are really where we think the action is for identifying new say therapeutics, as well as you know, including and considering all of the lovely things that polygenic risk scores offer the potential for us to really capitalize on in terms of helping uh, improve overall public health. Now, for mapping, you know, we're, for an individual disease, what we're really looking for here is something that is of medical importance, that is a clearly and crisply defined disease or trait. Part of that is, is driven by the thinking about how drugs are approved and how they're approved for a given indication. And so we really want to link these efforts to make sure that all of the workflow is, is pointed to the kinds of systems and structures we have set up for you know, actually treating people in the world. We wanna make sure that we are driven from the genetics. There are lots of ways of understanding human diseases, but we view the role of the genetics here as a kind of causal component that can help us really establish when he, uh, any association that we see between some trait or biomarker and a disease. We can use those genetics and that gen those genetic maps to really suss out whether this is likely to be a cause or consequence of the kind of disease process. And that power, that power of genetics to help us navigate that cause or consequence question in particular is the one that we're really enthusiastic about. And, we, and that's why there's so much focus and effort on really trying to take these genetic maps and push them forward. It will also help to understand what cells and tissues are relevant in the disease so that we have an opportunity to perform some of the molecular biological profiling activities that have already been described over the course of this meeting that are starting to help us understand and interpret these genetic associations, things like chromatin or even things like the different proteoforms that we heard from Emma this morning. All of those things are, are kind of potentially in the field of view uh, just through that lens of trying to figure out what the differences are between individuals that have a disease and those individuals that don't, or where you end up on a given trait that seems to be of relevance for particular outcomes. You can think about things like obesity or blood pressure to be very concrete, but we're, we're very open-minded at this point. And then kind of last but not least, it is absolutely essential that we have people. And without people, none of this will be possible. Uh, everything that we've heard so far over this you know, meeting has been the work of people and how we bring those people together and how we make sure their different expertise, their different priorities, their different 
kind of considerations and foci are really represented in this collaborative enterprise is another major aspect. Now, on the, the mapping side, I've got on the right hand of this slide an overview of the progress that we've made in schizophrenia genetics. I work a lot in schizophrenia. It's you know probably one of the diseases I'm most comfortable talking about the progress that we've been making. And you can see this sort of picture of the minor allele frequency in the population on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, you have this odds ratio. And we've got three different colored dots represented here. This is a beautiful slide that TJ Singh uh, knocked together on the back of the schizophrenia exome meta-analysis work that we've um, pushed to, to MedArchive that's currently in review. And you can see that there are different genomic profiling strategies. So over here, we've got the kind of array-based stuff from the common variants. Uh, the fine mapped coding variants from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium Schizophrenia effort are what are highlighted over here. And then on the left hand side of this slide are the rare variants that we've identified through two main strategies. One is exome sequencing and coding variants that offer particular value for this most important deliverable from the, the mapping effort, which is what are the actual genes that are relevant to disease, as well as some of the other stronger risk factors that may be perhaps more relevant in other contexts, particularly if you want to think about, say, polygenic uh, risk scores or clinical prediction, taking a full view of genomic risk factors will enhance our ability to identify individuals that are at high risk for given outcomes. And so we shouldn't just focus on the common variants for the PRS. We should also be incorporating some of these other larger risk factors when we think about the prediction dimensions. And you can see those copy number variants, but these copy number variants don't deliver genes in the same way. So they're an important part of the genomic risk, but they don't tell us the same kind of detail about the biology that we're interested in arriving at from the mapping efforts. In addition to delivering genes, we also need to move beyond case status. And, and what that means is that most of the genetic discovery work that has been conducted to date has been focused on the very simple basic question of whether someone has a given disease or not, that that case control is the workhorse, it is the lion's share of the work in the landscape. And that case control is super important for establishing what the risk factors are for getting you into the disease state, but they don't necessarily give you a complete picture about some of the other things that genetic investigation into diseases could teach us. For example, moderation on age of onset of disease or severity or treatment response, these things really matter to patients. If we can improve treatment response, and I think Naomi spoke to this very clear, clearly with the, the call for more work on medication data, and I think that's a great idea, and, and, and I know others are pursuing that as, as, as well. But moving beyond just this case status has to be on the roadmap for how we make maximal use of the data sets that we are trying to collect, aggregate, and, and organize, and build, and work with uh, as, a, as a broader community. And then, Finally, uh, but also of super importance, is the essentiality of diversifying these efforts. Uh, the H3Africa efforts that are sort of forerunners of ICDA, uh, the lovely talk that we heard from Andres and Ricardo about the Latin American Alliance for Genomic Diversity, the Genome Asia Project, or perhaps more recently that you'll hear a little bit about a little bit later on in the session, this COVID host genetics initiative is really trying to make this as international as possible, really make this a, a global collaborative enterprise. And, and I think that's a, a real feature that, that diversity is a strength in science. It is a strength in evolution. It is a strength in biology, and it should be a, a strength of our, our community uh, writ large. And so with that, I'll, I'll now turn the floor over to Cecilia, who's gonna walk us through about how we think about the, the mechanisms piece. And you're muted, Cecilia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. So uh, tying on to what uh, Ben said, so once we are happy that we have a reasonably saturated genetic map, our next aim is to functionalize all flagship disease risk nucleotides. Next slide, please. So this is work where we've seen some gorgeous examples yesterday, and here on the side is just the FDO locus, which is uh, highly debated still, but it's a great example to show how complex it is even to dissect one singular locus 
properly. And it's a very good example of what kind of barriers we're really sort of facing here. We need to be able to scale this up to work faster and uh, tackle many, many more loci at a much higher speed. Um, so, no, please don't. <laughs> uh, so, um, we, here we need to define the target genes, the effector genes, which cells and tissues they operate in, what function the uh, effector genes and proteins have, and what pathways and processes they operate in, and how this affects the actual phenotype or the clinical readout, the disease. Emma mentioned the spatio-temporal aspects, which I agree uh, are really important, and more data uh, has been pointing to this being a key crucial thing to uh, factor into study design, so we're going to dissect this as well. Uh, we're also interested in looking at transcripts and proteins and processes over developmental time points on various axes. So you can think about it in terms of cell cycle, like Emma talked about. We can talk, talk about it in terms of developmental uh, sort of stages and tissues, and also in a full organismal development. Scalability, cell line, cell, and tissue availability, and disease relevance are all key issues to consider here. And as Ben pointed out before, there isn't going to be a one-fits-all solution to all flagship disease projects. We aren't going to be able to bunk them together, but we will uh, have to tailor this specifically for each disease. Here, it's also really important that we will liaise with the ICVA mechanisms working group. You saw an excellent panel discussion from them yesterday, so you will have a flavor of what they're thinking about working on. And uh, their work is gonna be disease agnostic largely, where we will be disease focused. Next slide. So here I've uh, uh, borrowed a part of Mark McCarthy's slide, uh, who is a part of the medicines uh, working group and also the pharma council, who we work very closely with for medicines. So for the medicines, uh, we will utilize the knowledge based from the maps and mechanisms, which Ben and I've just talked you through. And we'll put this knowledge in disease specific contexts, which then will lend itself to inter interrogating disease onset, development and progression to disease and then disease progression. Like Ben talked about, we have only typically looked at diseases when they're already elicited and at that time point, uh, sometimes it's hard to perturbate. We will need to work on tissue and cells from individuals with onset disease, comparing that on multi-omics levels to, to controls, or use polygenic risk scores and rare variant information to interrogate individuals that are of higher risk uh, than a control group before of onset to characterize the perturbation of pathways and mechanisms by these variants. Um, we need proper ancestry representation, which we have discussed, but we also need to interrogate sex and age effects so we know how and if we can reach to a really truly personalized medicine here. The first clinical translation that maybe springs to mind from this work is nomination of novel drug targets, but in parallel we have ongoing discussions with the ICDA Pharma Council uh, of the need to do large-scale proteomic works to develop biomarkers and also, as you will have heard yesterday, discuss genomically informed clinical trials. I now have a big airplane uh, flying over my house. I apologize for the noise. <laughs> for each of these three nodes, maps, mechanisms, and medicines, we will connect and work seamlessly with the different working groups uh, that you have heard from uh, to work on these questions, but they don't necessarily focus on the flagship disease where we really need to amalgamate communities that are present. Uh, as Ben pointed out, cross disease information and leveraging knowledge between the different nodes, but also between the different diseases is going to be instrumental. So analytical rigor, large scale, and also fair data sharing and collaboration to tie into what Mike talked about before are going to be key. This needs to be properly scaled to deliver robust results that are reproducible, something that we have discussed over and over again. And we need to collaborate with our, our uh, organism models community uh, in an, a rigorous and ethical framework. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, key here uh, is that the flagship disease projects are aimed at facilitating collaboration, catalyze progress and innovation. So we're thinking about how to lay foundations for how we work together at scale, something that Mike touched upon and we're going to be keen to follow up with him. How do we build a scientifically excellent tailored community that is fair and inclusive and are uh, 
perfect to tackle each of these flagship disease projects? How do we disseminate best practices? How do we accelerate science at scales, not only uh, in genetics and globally? Uh, so those are ongoing discussions and we're uh, really curious to hear your input and thoughts about this. So next slide. Uh, so uh, with these questions at heart, we're working really hard at the moment. And as I mentioned, seeking input actively from different constituency for how we will define an intellectual framework for the questions that we need to ask to propel the knowledge for the M2M2M challenge in these diseases. We're working to map out what is known and what is not known in a systematic, coherent way. Uh, and also we're working on developing an organizational framework for how to ad address any gaps in knowledge and to drive diseases to completion. We're thinking about data generation hubs and analytical hubs and how we can drive this work in a, in a sort of open and uh, equitable fashion. So next slide. And with that, we want to hear from you. So we have posed a few questions that we're seeking your input on. We're posting a poll on Twitter and also on Slack here. And uh, once you have answered, we will summarize your responses and feedback that to you to keep you in the loop of the project. With this, we want to close this outline and uh, we look forward to having a discussion around this. Thank you so much. Great, thanks Ben and Cecilia so much for a really great presentation. We have several questions coming in from Slido. Um, ben, maybe I'll direct the first one to you. There's a question that says, many potential flagship diseases have environmental components as well as genetic components. How should uh, ICDA consider environmental phenotypes as it thinks about uh, flagship disease projects? I think that's an excellent question, Rachel. So, so I sort of perceive this in a couple of different ways. So, so some, environmental exposures do have genetic risk factors associated with them, like, for example, the alpha-3, alpha-5 subunit of the acetylcholine receptor is associated with smoking, and that's the single biggest genetic risk factor for lung cancer in the population, is a, a very good example of how genetics and environment are linked in a kind of fundamental way. There are some things that are a little less mediated and or obviously mediated than, say, something like smoking, like maybe air quality and air pollution and where you live and, and that sort of thing. And I, I think in the kind of environmental measures landscape, this idea of much more granular and much more individual level collection of such data is a real possibility. And, and so the degree to which we can start to both use those as additional phenotypes to map in terms of the genetics and use those phenotypes as ways to model the overall disease risk factors for different groups of individuals conditional on different amounts of genetic susceptibility makes a, a ton of sense as a kind of important area to focus, particularly on the prediction in the public health dimensions of when we think about common disease. And so I, I think that environmental research is also going through this like informatics revolution that genomics is going through. And I'm really encouraged and excited by the prospect of sort of working together with those communities to bring those into these kinds of large scale efforts. Great, thanks. So you're saying there's there's still a lot to be done in this space, which is what we'd like to hear. Um, Cecilia, I'll maybe uh, I'll uh, ask you one question before we move on. Uh, this is a question from Slido that I'm going to um, broaden a little bit, given your role as uh, co-chair of ICDA's organizing committee. The question says, how can we identify a niche within common diseases that already get lots of research attention and funding, such as diabetes? Uh, are there some ways, uh, are there some shared knowledge gaps uh, and I'll I'll maybe broaden that to say, you know, obviously there are many disease specific communities working uh, to understand the genetics of common diseases. Uh, can you speak to how ICDA intends to work and collaborate with these existing communities uh, to do the work to combine and accelerate efforts rather than duplicate? Yeah, so we, uh, it's a really good question. So it's important to point out that we have no intention of standing up any flagship disease projects uh, orthogonally to what's going on already. So what our aim is just to uh, facilitate uh, ongoing efforts, work with ongoing efforts, see what is lacking, what needs to be filled in and how we can help people. Uh, obviously, for instance, if you're working on a disease and you have no interest in ICDA supporting that disease, uh, we won't force ourselves upon us, but we do see that we have a, a role to fill in terms of uh, leveraging a community. 
and that is open and friendly and committed to uh, you know sh data sharing and knowledge sharing. Um, there is a, a wide range of stakeholders available. Uh, we have an active, enthusiastic pharma council with depth of knowledge in um, you know how to translate discoveries into more uh, sort of therapeutic areas. We have an amazing uh, data and platform uh, group that are working on solutions for how to host and, and sort of sp spread, I shouldn't say spread, but how to host and, and sort of make sure that people can do analyses in various parts of the world in a federated way. Uh, we have a lot of knowledge, as you will have seen in the mechanism group, for both on uh, technology developments and various um, model systems. So I see us as a round table in a, dis and a discussion forum for aggregating people across different stakeholders and that have a joint interest at heart of really driving the disease to nucleotide resolution. So for diabetes, for instance, uh, there are already successful ongoing efforts, for instance, in genetic mapping with the diagram consortium and all the other consortiums in diabetes that are now sort of popping up. And there is also the AMP uh, effort that is ongoing. So we would never want to duplicate that. But even in those settings, uh, they aren't fully funded to drive it to full nucleotide resolution. And it's also, uh, as been pointed out over and over again here, we don't have full global re representation either in the genetic discovery and even less so, I would actually argue both on the mechanisms and medicines aspect. So there is a lot left to be done in almost all diseases. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that here. So it is a forum for people, but it's sort of obviously voluntarily, as Ben pointed out, you need to have a champion and, and the group of champions to really drive this. And you would drive it, Ben and I would only facilitate. Thank you so much. I, I think that's a great pr transition to our next session, especially as you think, as we think about uh, improving our global diversity in these in these efforts uh, to move on to the next session for uh, today's uh, this this session that we're in now improving standards for global equity in scientific research. And so let's transition to um, to that talk, which will be presented by Nikki Tiffin, uh, who's the associate professor who's an associate professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa and who co-chairs the ICDA's Global Equity Working Group, along with Andre, uh, who, who spoke earlier. Uh, so Nikki, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you for joining us and for the opportunity to share with you the work of the Global Equity Working Group in the ICDA, which I co-chair with Andres. So I'm going to be talking about improving um, standards for global equity in, in scientific research. Um, I seem, seem to have a problem forwarding my... Uh, there we are. So our question um, that we've been asking, first of all, why is global equity important? We've heard a lot already in the session about the importance of diversity of research participants. But similarly, we also want to support the diversity of researchers and the people participating in making the research happen. Diversity can take many different um, sort of faces or um, ways of, of um, presenting. So I've just underlined here, for example, gender diversity, um, underrepresented groups or minorities, and also representation of the global South in undertaking research. So I've, pulled a few examples from the literature, but I think we can all agree there's no shortage of work out there showing that we need to work on diversity in research. The ICDA white paper has recommendation 19 that is specifically to promote global equity. Um, and, and we really believe that the understanding and treatment of common diseases must be a global activity. So the aim is to involve and include scientific researchers from across the globe in the ICD activities and to take active steps to decrease barriers to equitable participation. So this is our charter from the ICDA white paper um, to promote inclusive, fair and ethical practices to enable worldwide equitable access to and benefits from scientific research by engaging key stakeholders across social, economic, political, and geographical borders to collaboratively devise and implement effective solutions to needs and barriers. So it's quite mouthy, but if we come back to it, our, our essence is we're asking, what does global equity look like? 
how can we describe it, how can we measure it, and how can we promote it? So we've started work in the, uh, in the Global Equity Working Group on building a global equity standard. Our vision for this is that it's a tool to help us understand how global equity can be defined um, and helping us to achieve practical global equity targets. So we've got three stages. The first is to build a framework that describes the key elements of global equity and what we think global equity looks like. Um, and then we need a standardized way to measure those elements and some practical global equity targets that we can all work towards. So the framework we envisage as, as generalized and constant, but the metrics that we might use to, um, to measure the different elements of the framework are more likely to, to be context specific. And then the output that we intend to produce is a, is a specific standard that can be used as a tool for self-evaluation or for ongoing monitoring and evaluation of global equity. So step one is to define this global equity framework. So we've done quite a bit of work on this and we've come up with these five themes that we believe are, are inherent or core to uh, defining global equity. We've included fairness, which is about equitable treatment of collaborators and, and participants too, to make sure that research doesn't exacerbate inequalities and that it in fact advances equality. And this really speaks to themes of social justice and non-discrimination. Our second theme, inclusiveness, is about diversity in researchers, collaborators and participants, and ensuring that, that everybody has an, an opportunity to get involved. So this can also be achieved through outreach and community engagement. Benefit sharing is our third theme, and this is about adequate sharing of benefits, not only for participants, but also for the contributors to the research, the researchers themselves. So this could um, look like research capacity building, sustainability of research, um, developing skills and sharing of IP. Our fourth theme is access, and this is about adequate opportunity to conduct research and adequate opportunity to collaborate and part participate. And this is quite a diverse theme in that we can talk about affordability, technology for participation, um, even time zones and being in the same time zones, which I know many of us have felt in this meeting too, um, allowing access to, to participate. Financial access, political, um, intellectual property, and then language and cultural translation is also an area where we can work on promoting access. And then finally, in this theme, procedural values. In this theme, we're talking about general values which, um, which guide research conduct, um, guide the use uh, and dissemination of benefits and results. And this talks to, to ideas of accountability, transparency, and general governance. So for our first, um, first steps to implement the framework, we decided to select a use case that we could use as a prototype or a, a, practice, a practice run for developing um, or, or identifying metrics and developing our standard further. So for our prototype, we've selected um, the ICDA working groups um, as the first context in which we'd like to develop metrics to, to measure um, global equity. So we're building and testing this framework of themes applied specifically to ICDA working groups as our prototype or our first instance. But we see that there'll be many future cases once we've um, sort of um, moved the framework, settled on a framework and moved the process forward. So for example, we would maybe in the future develop metrics for consortia and networks, scientific associations. I have a whole list here of different kinds of contexts where we feel that having a standard for global equity might be useful, conferences, conference committees, uh, et cetera. So we've started the work of specifying metrics. I want to really emphasize this is a work in progress. So we don't have specific metrics to share with you yet, but what we can share with you is the kind of thinking that we, we're um, undertaking around what these uh, metrics might look like. So, for example, in fairness, we've, we're thinking that metrics could look at participation in activities and meeting, 
uh, meetings, accessibility uh, to participate, ability to travel. Of course, that's not been relevant this year, but hopefully in the future, we'll be back to meeting more face-to-face. -face. Um, technology platforms and, and ability to use those platforms, um, training opportunities and fellowships and, and who can access those. In terms of inclusiveness, we'll be looking at things like group composition, uh, who are the active participants in terms of their diversity, who are leading working groups. Um, and we can look at things like gender, ethnicity or ancestry and um, at underrepresented groups and how they're being included in our ethics, um, in our ICDA working groups. Benefit sharing, um, we can look at who has access to what policies and guidelines and advisory boards that can assist with, um, with enabling benefit sharing. Uh, for access, we've got an example around measuring the open dissemination of group outputs. And then procedural values would be about having open meeting minutes, for example, um, and, and being open about group membership, uh, ensuring we're transparent. So measuring um, in which elements we're transparent. Um, and of course, sharing our global equity evaluation outcomes for, for the ICDA working groups. And then in the long term, uh, or the medium term and long term, uh, we'd like to pro propose targets for these metrics that we've developed. So what should we be aiming to achieve for each metric, maybe in the medium term and then also in the long term? So what should we really be aspiring to in terms of um, global equity in these measurable metrics? So overall, the aims are to, of the working group are to promote global equity through very practical approaches. So we want to be able to present and use the framework and the metrics as a tool. It's a practical application um, supporting work ongoing towards um, supporting global equity. We see it very much as a tool that would be used for self-evaluation and self-administered uh, monitoring and evaluation to keep an eye on progress um, towards the targets. And of course, the long-term aims are equally important, and that is to design interventions to ensure that we can reach those targets. So if we use these metrics and the ongoing um, M&E, we can identify the possible barriers to achieving global equity. And if we're able to identify those barriers, that gives, it gives us opportunities to propose um, and implement solutions. So I'd just like to say thank you, of course, to everyone in the ICDA and then the contributors from this particular working group. Um, I'd just like to uh, be transparent. We have um, participants in the working group from six continents. We've got approximately 11 nationalities who, who live in nine different countries, and we're about 53% female in the working group. These are some of the countries that are, um, that are represented in our membership. And also, of course, to say um, thank you to um, Rachel and um, um, Kate, of course, um, from the ICDA, who've been supporting our working group. So thank you. Thanks so much, Nikki. I'm, I'm really excited to see this work moving forward. And thank you for that great presentation. Um, maybe I'll start with a question I have. Um, as you think, because I think you mentioned that the, the goal is to really release a standard that groups can self implement. We're not going to obviously be policing anyone's, you know, equity measures as, as part of an ICDA goal. Um, but then again, there's this obvious uh, maybe, maybe need or, or, or disparity between the actual resources that some of these uh, activities will require. Uh, and so I wonder if your working group plans to make, say, recommendations to uh, funding bodies or to other uh, organizations that might be able to address some of those actual concrete resource needs. Yeah, so I think um, that's, uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, I think when, uh, when we start to draw up these metrics, I think this will give us really an opportunity to identify where we are lacking um, in, in resources to, to take global equity forward. And I think that those kind of evaluations can be very useful for, for organizations or funding bodies who wish to promote global equity. I mean, it gives us something very concrete to say, this is the problem we've got, this is the blocker we have. Um, we, can, we can show you that we've implemented these various steps, but we still haven't been able to reach our targets. And, and this is a very concrete way that we can, um, we can identify what needs to be done. 
Uh, so I think it can give very specific targets. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll now move on to our final discussion for this session. Uh, this will take place as a, a panel discussion uh, led by Helen Parkinson, who's the head of molecular archival resources at EMBL EBI and is a co-chair of uh, ICDA's data platforms working group along with David Glazer, who couldn't be here today. Uh, along, uh, Helen will be joined by Claire Bernard, who's the senior director for product for the data sciences platform at the Broad Institute and Mike Noy, who's the director of the Cambridge Baker Systems Genomics Initiative at the University of Cambridge, uh, as well as a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute and the Munz Chair of Cardiovascular Prediction and Prevention at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. Uh, this panel's discussion will really focus, I think, on thinking about data platforms for international science, which is, of course, a topic that we talk a lot about, but that I think is uh, a real challenge to implement at a global scale. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the discussion today, and I'll turn it over to Helen to introduce the panel and the discussion. Great, thank you very much, Rachel. Apologies for the technical glitch there. So I'm pleased to um, introduce the session on data platforms for international science. Um, we've already had some discussions in our previous meetings uh, and also with our working group around um, our, the activities that we're doing here. And I'm gonna work briefly through some of those activities. Then I'm going to introduce Claire Bernard, who is um, Senior Director for the Data Sciences Platform at the Broad, and Mike Inouye, who's um, the director of the Baker Systems Genomics Initiative um, and associated with the University of Cambridge. So what have we been doing for the data platforms piece? So there were, to orientate you, there are two recommendations for the uh, data platform piece. So first is to create a shared data platform, um, which should be developed to bring together diverse user communities by offering a set of common features and functionalities. And this includes both a repository environment and an analysis environment. It's clear that for the data platform, we're not only looking at a single monolithic, one platform to rule them all, but there are gonna be lots of platforms. We already see these appearing and we heard about some of them yesterday. Um, and for recommendation 16, uh, we're looking at creating genotype and phenotype portals. And this is to make anyone able to fetch and integrate data from different kinds of repositories. And there's a long shopping list here of different resources, some of which exist, some of which are emerging and some of which will be created as we proceed with the ICDA. Um, and to illustrate some of the challenges, but also to provoke some discussion today, we focused on uh, polygenic risk score repository. We heard a lot about that yesterday. Um, and also to look at some disease specific information as a follow on from the previous session. So what have we done so far in the Data Platforms Working Group? I want to thank our diverse set of attendees. We're open to more people attending uh, and also to Kate, who's uh, making sure we actually deliver things. So we have a charter, which is to ensure that we develop and deliver these platforms um, and to address the elements of the maps and molecules to medicine challenge. So, so far we've published a recommendation, we have a charter and we've started to define pilot projects. So working with the collaborators um, in this working group, we've started to think about what would be the characteristics of those pilot projects. And our next steps are to publish the, the, the criteria for those um, and then to fund and execute them, but also to scale up. And so we're looking at some of the scaling challenges, particularly that were identified in the previous talk, but that have been talked about is how we get from, you know, what are hundreds of thousands of participants in cohorts to many, many millions, how we then actually work to integrate these data. Um, and so with that, I will hand over to Mike, um, who will introduce the Polygenic School Catalog. Okay, uh, thanks, Helen. Um, so uh, we're, we're just, uh, so this is a case study in terms of data platforms. So we've recently put together uh, something called the Polygenic Score Catalog. And that's, that's really been made possible uh, by several uh, key groups, key partners. So one of which is, uh, is EBI, uh, the University of Cambridge Health Data Research UK and the Baker Institute in, in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, really what we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to fill a, a bit of a gap in the uh, in, in terms of the, the, the resources that the community had at its disposal. And one of those was making uh, polygenic risk score studies uh, reproducible, uh, and, uh, and especially in, in the context of providing uh, the, the information necessary to calculate polygenic scores in independent studies and basically independently establish their validity. So, so a, a very talented postdoc uh, and I and, and, uh, and, and representatives from uh, EBI, uh, particularly uh, Sam Lambert and, and Jackie MacArthur, uh, designed uh, the kind of the prototype for the Polygenic Score Catalog. Um, 
And effectively, our, our sort of goal, as, as stated there, is to provide an open database of all published polygenic scores. So that's the goal, is that we're going to be uh, scaling up to uh, every published uh, score. Um, and that's, to, that's also uh, basically drawing from the, from the literature uh, in order to get consistent uh, and annotated metadata, uh, working with the, both the, uh, the data files and the authors to, uh, to secure and, and provide the scoring files, that is the, the variance uh, and the effect weights and effect alleles uh, for each score. Um, and also to assess uh, and, and look at the fulfillment of, uh, of, of reporting standards that have recently been established, uh, in particular, uh, a collaboration between uh, the catalog and uh, the, uh, the ClinGen Complex Disease Working Group uh, on a, a reporting standard, 22 item reporting standard called the PRS Reporting Statement, PRSRS. Um, and also, uh, in, in terms of once we've established that, uh, also provide the capability for independent benchmarking of polygenic score performance. You know, basically to say, you know, which polygenic score uh, performs best in a particular setting, right? And also to try and define or help uh, the researcher define best. So you can see there, uh, the pgscatalog.org, a little screenshot. So we've got about uh, 300 or more uh, scores in there already. Uh, over 109 uh, publications uh, annotated. Um, many are, 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 are considered, but, uh, but the inclusion criteria is, is such that uh, the polygenic score, we have to actually at this point have the polygenic score affect um, the alleles and weights um, and, uh, and have this analytic validity established. So there's quite a few more publications that have gone in there. And our, our sort of goal for, for a future use case is that the researcher or the clinical informatician um, has the, their own sort of genomic data uh, they want to assess the, the, the uh, analytic validity and, and get some idea of the clinical validity of a polygenic score in a particular uh, setting, whether it's uh, for a particular ancestry or for a particular uh, you know, use case, um, to be able to select uh, the most appropriate polygenic score for that use case and to uh, potentially in the future to calculate that specific score for that genomic data that they have. So, uh, so that's kind of the a little bit of a flavor of, uh, of what we have and, and where we're heading with the Polygenic Score Catalog. Uh, and I believe I will hand over to, uh, to Claire. Hi. Um, yes, if you go to the next slide. Um, so this is, this is also a case study. Um, the Cancer Data Aggregator is a project that we've just started working on. Um, it's funded by NCI and is a collaborative project between ISB, The Broad, and Seven Bridges. Um, and I think it's also a, it's a really good example of kind of a tool and a component within a broader ecosystem of data platforms. Um, the, the goal of the project is um, to enable cancer researchers, um, as well as um, portal developers and other cloud resources, to query data across the different data coordinating centers and data um, commons at NCI. Um, initially, starting with starting out with the MCI data type specific resources like the Genomics Data Commons, the Proteomic Data Commons, Imaging Data Commons, um, but there's also a longer term goal to incorporate non NCI data resources as well. Um, and the the goal of this project is to develop this API that enables enables groups to query across all of those and enables more integrative analyses, um, so that you can search for a specific type of cancer. Um, across all of those resource, resources. So the long-term the long -term goal is really federated search. Um, and we hope that on top of this API, we will have kind of a, a broad ecosystem of different portals um, that can be, can be leveraging this API. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions to get the discussion started, but I'd encourage people also to um, put things into Slido. Um, if they wouldn't mind. Um, so the first question is, both for Mike and Claire, what are the challenges of starting a resource in this kind of complex ecosystem? Mike, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, obviously. Um, I, I guess one of the main things that, that I have in mind uh, when, I, I guess, the developing new resource is that, you know, you don't, you don't just want to develop it and kind of launch it uh, and, and just sort of say, okay, great, done. I mean, it's a great time to take a breath, but I think 
the one of the main challenges that I've found is that you have to sustain it. Uh, you have to make it into a learning sort of uh, a learning sort of platform. So it has to constantly be uh, there has to be some sort of you know engagement between the developers and the continuous sort of development thereof and the users. Um, and it, it it has to kind of uh, it has to develop in such a way that uh, you know that it's becoming you know more and more useful and can be built upon. So once you sort of become uh, part of the building blocks uh, of the of that ecosystem, you, you really know that you've 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 done your your job. Um, but uh, but you know really do, you know doing all the little things and and making it into a self sustaining learning uh, platform is is a really critical challenge. Thank you, Claire. Would you like to respond to the first question? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity is that we're not developing these um, these platforms in silos. It is a very collaborative effort. Um, and so that means figuring out how to integrate um, across lots of different systems. Um, and, you know, with the example of the cancer data aggregator, you know, each of those data resources and data comments has a different, a different architecture um, and different, um, they're data organized in a different way using different data structures requiring data harmonization across across of those um, and then when you're part of it part of an ecosystem you also want to build your components so that others can build on top of them and that means you know maintaining stable interfaces over time um, and so maintaining stable interfaces while also giving yourself the flexibility to optimize um, and make changes um, to improve those resources over time um, is, is also always a challenge Great. Thank you, Claire. So that, that moves on really nicely to my next question, which is how can we align across these different data resources? So you've got this scenario in which you have this nice um, NCI focused resource and you have some kind of contracts around the pieces around the API. But how do we then move that on to, for example, talk to a cohort that's in a different platform in a different country um, and that perhaps might be challenged by things like lack of bandwidth or different different stuff? Yeah, so I mean, the thing that makes us the that um, helps the most is standards. Um, you know, the more that we can adopt common standards across these different platforms, the easier it's going to be. Um, you know, one of the particularly important standards that we've been using a lot is um, the GA4GH DIRST standard um, to link to file data. Um, but I think also, you know, standards around um, kind of data storage, access control, and data models um, are all, you know, hugely helpful here. Um, I think also just you know as we develop software components, thinking about how how we can keep those um, as modular and pluggable as possible, um, and how we can enable them to run on different infrastructure. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Would you like to address the question from the perspective of the PGS catalog? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I I think it's I I think with I, I it's. I guess in terms of aligning across the different resources and, and portals, it's uh, for the PGS catalog. I, I think um, we're we're fairly. I, I think we're working on basically building standards, particularly with uh, with ClinGen, um, and providing kind of pro programmatic access through APIs. Um, I, I think one of the one of the things that we're really gonna, I, I think, um, you know, in, need to engage with, and, and I think is on the horizon, is is around how specific. Uh, the new sort of resources and portals get, and how the PGS catalog then engages with those, right? So uh, one of the things that has come up has been like around uh, disease specificity. So if, if you wanted, uh, if, if you want a particular resource around cardiovascular disease, how does the PGS catalog in, engage with that? How does it, uh, how does it, uh, you know, what, what does it really need? And I think having that domain expertise uh, in-house so that you've got people who can talk to each other um, on both the, the platform side and on the, uh, you know, when you need sort of additional portals and resources um, is just really quite critical. So uh, I think, you know, we're going to be bumping up against that uh, with the PGS catalog for sure. Mm -hmm. So given the scenario that um, ICDA has of flagship, flagship disease areas, do you think there's a potential for engagement there and how would you like to engage those groups in that case? I, I, absolutely, there's potential for engagement. I think you know we're we're just at the you know we're still sort of embryonic in this space, uh, and uh, I think you know really just starting the conversation about uh, well, a kind of familiarizing ourselves with the resources and, and what exactly the the information that they provide um, is is the first step, and and I think you know trying to align ourselves in terms of where we're heading, um, and uh, establishing what the uh, the disease 
uh, you know, flagships would need, you know, how they would like it. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's those are sort of the first things, but, you know, I, I think that would be, uh, that would be great if, uh, if anyone uh, wants to start that conversation, we're all ears. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions coming from Slido. So the first one is, how can we work to support the lower and middle income countries that don't have as many resources or infrastructure to participate in scientific research driven by common data platforms? Who would like to take a crack at that one? Um, I'm happy to start with that. Um, I think you know a really important aspect is to you know, make the data platforms as open as possible. Um, I think free and open source software is a big part of that. Um, another thing that we think uh, think about a lot is um, you know making sure that when you know, data is gener generated in those countries, um, we're providing the tools to make sure that the people in those countries are retaining control and ownership of that data, um, and making sure that things like data storage and compute can also stay in country. Um, and then I think there's there's also you know other technological considerations to keep in mind. Um, like when, um, you know, for countries that have you know, lower in internet connectivity um, to make sure that we're building tools that still enable uploading data in those environments. Mike? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, we've, we've worked a lot with, um, uh, well, in, in my past research, worked a lot with Southeast, Southeast Asia and really basic stuff like internet connectivity and, and making sure that, you know, what you're developing is, uh, is stable and, and you're not, you know, they don't have to download, uh, let's say, you know, like five gigabytes worth of information. That's just, it, it's just not feasible for, uh, for lots of uh, lower middle income countries. Um, I think the other, the other aspect I'd, I'd raise is that, uh, I mean, I, I do feel kind of a responsibility around um, both providing a platform and providing as much sort of support and training uh, as, as possible for, uh, for those, uh, for those groups. I mean, it's, it's something that we we bake into our collaborations um, with uh, you know collaborators in, in Vietnam uh, and elsewhere uh, in, uh, in in Nepal as well, and it's a, it's an important aspect. So I, I think uh, you know that sort of thing, making sure that that's sort of part of the support that you provide as part of the platform, uh, I think is really important to make that kind of you know explicit that we're here to help. I think there are some great models that are coming from the community as well. So we know that H3 Africa has done a great job with training. They have virtual classrooms operating in many countries in Africa. Um, I think there's also a piece about ensuring that there's some capacity building so that this isn't only about a particular data set, but about an ability to enable uh, people who may be resource limited in the local setting to, to develop some of the capacity. And this speaks to sort of building that infrastructure that goes along with that large cohort of individuals that might be generated in the country. Um, so we know that you need to have the resources to both generate the materials, but also to store and manage that data. And I think there's a real opportunity there that comes working with collaborators in, in different countries to understand how that can be achieved. And I, I know there are some good models out there, but I think because of the different country settings vary so much in terms of the, the resources available and also challenges of the local funding environment, it's worth looking at country specific capacity things. And I, I think that would be a great way forward to work with uh, the, the diversity groups involved in um, ICDA to understand how we can contribute more. So I have a potentially slightly more contentious question from Slido, which is how can we influence journals to require weights of any published PRS? Uh, I'm gonna kick that over to Claire. No, no, it's uh, it's it's a great question, uh, and uh, I think that's that's something that you know that, that we are uh, talking to people about. Um, it is part of of reproducible science. Uh, it's part of the PRS reporting statement uh, from the ClinGen uh, Complexes Working Group in the catalog. Um, and it, it also is, is part of the uh, NHGRI's uh, policy around making uh, you know, summary uh, genomic data available, uh, unrestricted, if, if, if at all appropriate. So I guess without getting into too much sort of mechanistic stuff, I, I think there's, there is a real kind of, um, I, I think journals want to actually make that information available. I think they, they feel that it is, uh, it is indeed important. Uh, and I, I think it's just, you know, what, how do they motivate, right, uh, 
the people who develop these scores in order to make that information available, right? So from a journal's point of view, all they can really do is say, you know, you really should do this, you know, here's a checklist, please check the box and provide the data. If not, you know, why not? And then what? And then what happens, right? So I think that they're, they're only so powerful uh, when it comes to enforcing, um, you know, even funder policies. So th there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a piece missing there, but, you know, I like to think that, you know, we're appealing to people's, uh, you know, better angels, uh, and um, and you know really trying to ensure that what we're building is a community that's open uh, and is doing you know uh, it, you know making uh, data available you know in a fair FAIR fashion um, and thereby you know doing the best science that they can. Okay, so maybe that question could be rephrased as uh, what should funders do to ensure that the the PRS scores are, are shared appropriately? Do you think that there's a different role for the funders? Uh, I, I will, I will sort of, uh, well, a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, I have no power there, uh, but, um, I, I mean, look, it's kind of like the same scenario. I mean, even, even funders that you just, we, they just don't have, uh, the bandwidth funders don't even have the bandwidth to, uh, to twist researchers arms. I, I, I really think that, uh, you know, the, the best sort of approach here is, is really to persuade, to educate first off, right, that some researchers don't know that actually this is policy and, and, and is good for science, actually. Um, and, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, we as a community can continue to educate ourselves and make sure that if our colleagues or if we hear about, you know, someone who's not sharing their score or whatever, um, you know, to researchers for reproducible purposes, then you know, we should really kind of raise that with them and say, you know, look, this is uh, this is important uh, for the community that um, you know that we make it available. Okay. Sly, would you like to come in on the challenges of um, sharing data in the journal world? Um, so, I mean, I think one approach that that we've taken is to um, kind of give researchers a lot of control over. Um, over who they give access to as they share data um, in a really granular way. Um, and I think by kind of providing people with more tools around sharing data granularly, you can get them more comfortable sharing data more openly over time. Um, it kind of seems, seems a little counterintuitive, but, um, but that, that's been one of our approaches um, is just kind of providing more and more tools to enable data sharing um, and um, incentivize data sharing um, and and give people the tools to do it themselves, so that they um, they f they feel they feel control and ownership. I think that's a great point. It has to be quite easy. You don't want to go and type for four hours into another interface and to go through the whole pain you did of sharing the paper in the journal in the first place. Okay, so we have a couple more questions on uh, polygenic scores. Uh, so the first one is an interesting question, uh, which is about licensing uh, polygenic scores. Should they be considered as IP protected by universities and institutes? Or should they be free for commercial use? Uh, should they uh, free? Well, okay. Well, so so look, polygenic scores. I suppose to some extent they can be treated treated the same as GWAS summary statistics, and the the that sort of has been looked into extensively within this community. Many people here have have looked at you know the benefits and risks of sharing. Uh, and indeed commercializing GWAS summary statistics. And it's come down uh, you know, very clearly on the, the benefit of sharing GWAS summary statistics, very much out, outweighs risks, and uh, indeed they, they should be shared uh, unrestrictedly. Um, you know, there are obviously kind of common, you know, like various licenses, Creative Commons, et cetera, um, which can place some sort of guardrails on, uh, on in terms of like commercial use and that sort of thing. Um, that's still kind of, I think, a little bit of a gray area, the different sort of, say, uh, licenses. But uh, when it comes to polygenic scores, I, I think in this context, uh, there really is not much difference. Uh, and, you know, we really should be um, sharing in a, you know, fairly uh, unrestricted way polygenic scores. Um, and, you know, if I, I think one of the, one, one of the real sort of concerns that people continuously raise with me is, is still around identifiability, participant re-identifiability. 
Um, uh, that's because of uh, papers from years and years ago that were using GWAS summary statistics. Um, for that, I mean, that, that really, I, I don't think, it, it's even less of a concern with polygenic scores, especially because uh, GWAS summary statistics, or the polygenic scores have been many, many times, you know, more, they've been post-processed from GWAS summary statistics, if, if they use GWAS summary statistics at all. So uh, look, I, I think there's, there's, very, there, there's a very weak argument for uh, not sharing polygenic scores. And I, I still, I think that there's a pretty weak argument for why they should be not shared because they, you know, someone wants to, to commercialize them. Um, so look, it's ultimately each person sort of does their own sort of research um, and they're, they're welcome to try and translate it uh, as they wish. Uh, but they, you know, I, I think they do have to weigh up the kind of best scientific, academic scientific practices um, and, and try and live up to those standards as well. So we know that some communities share fewer summary statistics data sets for GWAS than others. Is that pattern of, you know, uh, some commercial organizations and also some, some research communities not sharing mirrored in the, in the, in the PGS catalog? Do you see some cases where you just don't get many scores? And cancer would be the case that we've identified for GWAS. So um, I, I think we haven't done, we haven't sat down and looked at that in a, in a systematic way. Um, so I, I'd be loath to sort of say anything uh, about that really, but it would not surprise me if the, the same sort of uh, you know, behavior applied in, in, the, in the PGS space. Um, I, I think a lot of that is still just educational. I think just some communities just aren't as used to, I mean, we just come, we're so, we're so privileged in a way that we come out of genomics and, uh, you know, we have the, you know, the human genome project really educating us about uh, the importance of data sharing uh, and the fact that they, the human genome is for all of humanity. But some researchers, they come out of a completely different culture. Um, and, uh, you know, to some extent, the conversation just needs to be had. So, you know, it's, it's something that um, we keep in mind and, and you know, maybe it's, it's just something that we'll try and, and run some workshops on to make sure that, you know, all communities have the chance to understand the importance of this. So if anybody from this community wants to speak to Mike about sharing the data, they're welcome. Uh, so there's one final question before we wrap the session up, which is, is the PGS catalog already being used by public health agencies in different countries? Um, I wouldn't say public health agencies. So polygenic scores are not being utilized, to my knowledge, by public health agencies uh, in, in any country. That's not to say that it couldn't be. I mean, it's, you can download the entire PGS catalog right now uh, and use it for, you know, for that purpose without our knowledge. Um, so the short answer to that question is, uh, is no, and I don't know. Okay. I guess if anybody does know, they can continue this discussion on the Slack um, after the session. Thank you very much to Mike and Claire for their presentations and also the discussion. And thank you to the audience for putting their questions into Slido. Rachel. Great. Thanks, Helen and, and Claire and Mike uh, for a really interesting discussion. Um, and really to all the speakers and panelists and audience members who've been asking questions for this session. And we've really covered a lot of ground. Um, and I don't know if, if you can tell that I am so excited to be working with all this, uh, these truly generous and thoughtful and diverse members of the community to facilitate new efforts to accelerate international science uh, in an equitable and sustainable way. Um, but I really am. Uh, so now we're gonna move into a break, the last break before the last session of the meeting. Since we are running a few minutes behind, let's plan to come back right at the top of the hour at 5 p.m. UTC. Uh, and then we will close everything out. So thanks everyone, we'll see you soon.